Hey, I'm Steve, also known as Terramantis. And I'm Vadi. Now, I don't know about you, Vadi, but in a way, the Dark Souls franchise has ruined gaming for me. I mean, the Souls series creates such an engrossing and fascinating experience that many other titles just feel as though they pale in comparison. I know what you mean. It's really difficult to find other games that fill that void. Well, in this video, we're hoping to help with that. We're going to talk about five of the best titles that, in spite of their indie budgets, look extremely promising while also capturing that same soul we love in our games. That's right. We'll discuss what features drew us into these games and why each of these titles captures a similar feeling to that of Dark Souls. All right, Steve, where should we start this list? I think we should start with Death's Gambit, a game with merciless timed combat and bosses equally as unforgettable and complex as anything you'd see in Dark Souls. The first thing I noticed about the game was just how beautiful Death's Gambit is. The pixel art harkens back to the best of the 32-bit generation, and unlike Souls, the colors pop, giving the world a brilliant eye-catching motif throughout. But very much like a Souls game, Death's Gambit features extremely tactical combat situations. No enemies feel like they're placed just to be filler or fodder for your weapons. In fact, nearly every enemy placement appears as though it was a plotted out scenario to derive intelligent problem solving from the player. Take this stage for example. Here I quickly learned that these switches trigger spikes that eject up from the floor. Then, shortly after that I encountered this hulking wolf creature with a magical crystal hammer. I also discovered that it hits like a truck. Next, I learned that upon death, instead of losing souls like in Dark Souls, I lost one of my phoenix feather which could then be retrieved where I died. Losing a feather is equivalent to as if I had lost an Estus Flask charge. It's your healing item and you only have so many of them. Now upon returning and gathering my feather back, I decided to jump over the spike traps and allow the enemy to walk through them so that the spikes could do some of the work for me. I also opted to use daggers so I could attack quickly and move just as fast when he started to wind up with that gigantic hammer. And this time around, after knowing about the traps and altering my tactics, with some time dodges and attacks, I killed him without even being hit. Shortly after I picked up a new feather that healed me for a lot more HP, but it was much slower to refill. So in a way, you get to choose how your Estus Flask, the feathers, operate. This idea of controlling how things operate branch into combat as well. There's special abilities that can be obtained and equipped to hotkeys. These special attacks are on a cooldown and range from things like a penetrating shot from your bow to a spinning attack from your halberd. These special abilities, their cooldowns, and the hotkeys assigned to them make some of the combat situations feel like an MMO. But none more so is this MMO feeling brought more to life than with boss encounters. Each boss has phases that can change the mechanics of a fight. Take the Tundra Lord, for example. This decaying ice minotaur has many mechanics. Most notably, the fight takes place on a platform teetering into an abyss. If you allow it to tip too far to one side, you'll fall off to your death. So a balance must be found not only in dodging and blocking attacks, but also managing to shift the platform. Then, after the initial phase, the Tundra Lord will leap into the background and rain down gigantic ice blocks and these skulls marked on the ground make you aware of where impending danger will land. And this comes full circle back to Death's Gambit pulling from Souls-like games where it's imperative for you to be aware of your surroundings to survive. Overcoming and learning the tactics to each boss is extremely satisfying, which is a fundamental aspect of every Souls game. It's not always easy to get the feeling of a Souls game right, but Ata, an isometric game by Enemy Entertainment, achieves that. In the short demo I played, I was really drawn in by the familiar combat, I was challenged just enough as I threw myself against encounters again and again, and I was intrigued by the surface story to the point where I actually hunted down item descriptions just so I could read them for more information. You play as the Shield Maiden, a heroine who has set out to save the world tree named Yggdrasil from a poisonous corruption named Aether. And even just from the demo, you start to get a feel for the Norse mythology influence that Aether is trying to tap into, and I really do hope that they go deeper into this culture in their settings and their characters, because I do think there's a lot of potential here. But if potential is on one side of the coin, then criticism does have to be on the other. If anything, criticism for Aether should stem from the fact that it's a bit too similar to Souls. 
With each of these games, there's this opportunity to test some new gameplay twist and the effect it has on the genre. But from what we've seen in Ata's short gameplay demo, we're still waiting to see what new mechanics it might contribute, and it is a bit early to say. But so far, the most interesting thing is this really Diablo-esque loot system, where even the most basic enemies can drop really interesting rare loot, uh, which makes your character feel powerful and more unique compared to someone else who might be playing alongside you, for example. And a great deal of replayability is lended to a game that has randomized loot, because even playing through an area that you've cleared multiple times, that can become exciting, because something interesting and something rare can drop. There are also a few other hints at other mechanics that they're experimenting with. Uh, when you die, for example, there's this slot machine style window that pops up, and the wheel starts rolling only to land on this message. Perhaps there will be like a randomized death penalty mechanic here? I'm definitely curious, and it's going to be exciting to see how they build on that when the final game is out, because the core gameplay is definitely solid. To put it simply, I often think a game is good when I have to think critically about my strategy when I take out enemies, and then if I'm rewarded for thinking that way. For example, when I was up against this hulking giant with a halberd, She's almost like a mini-boss, so I equipped my shield and used its special frost parry to make this enemy less of a threat. Uh, when I was against the boss of the demo, I eventually realized that a long drawn out fight was a sure way I was going to lose, uh, because the boss constantly summons adds and gets more powerful over time. So I equipped the greatsword to take out a swarm of enemies at once, and then, once that was done, I switched to a dual wielding stance and bursted him down as quickly as possible. When facing against those shielded enemies that attack really quickly, I made sure I had my shield up and I kicked away their guard instead. When up against these big enemies with two hammers, the best thing to do was to dodge their slam and attack from behind. Uh, there are also aggressive skeletons that have stealth, and wizards with ranged attacks, and these all become really interesting at the end of the demo because it starts to throw these enemies at you in different combinations, and sort of dissecting them in the right order became almost a puzzle, because the shielded enemies block your attacks, and the assassin skeletons need to be dealt with first, and... Yeah, so overall, when you have to drastically switch up your weaponry and your tactics like this just to get through a level without using too much of your limited healing, I think that's a damn good sign of capturing what Souls is about to me. Ata, even though it draws liberally from the Souls UI and the Souls combat, it gets it right, which is the best thing for the consumer and the player, and there is a lot of potential mechanics I hope they explore that can be built on a really good fundamental base. Not every game needs to have swords and sorcery to capture the magic of what makes the Soul series great. Ghost Song is an example of that. On the surface, a sci-fi homage to Super Metroid, but in reality, it's so much more. Ghost Song is a moody and atmospheric trek through an alien environment that embodies isolationism, loneliness, and discovery. Uh, okay, so, so it is a lot like Metroid. But those same characteristics are important to Dark Souls as well. You see, much like Dark Souls, in Ghost Song, you begin your adventure in a mysterious land. You don't know why you're here or what's happening. Surrounding you, though, on the alien moon of Lupoto, is a strange and beautiful setting. Neon pastels drape the background, and a spirit runs past your character as you awaken from unconsciousness. You'll soon find out that things here are cryptic, and you must discover them for yourself. With the help of equally cryptic NPCs, the story will begin to piece itself together, but some things are never explained outright. If you're a hunter, then be careful. A large bounty was placed on someone who lives here. Hunters have come from all over. The intricacies of combat, for example, are not explained at all. And in Ghost Song, much like in Souls, death can come very easily. A few hits in your soul will expel from your body. No do-overs. Obviously, learning the mechanics of combat is important then. 
So first off, your gun acts like a stamina gauge of sorts. Ammo is limited. If you expend all of your rounds, a long period of rest must be maintained in order for your gun to replenish. An empty weapon at a heated moment can be devastating. As a result, managing attacks is extremely important to your survival through what is essentially merciless combat. Merciless with one caveat. Your shield barrier can save you many, many times. So you have your health which will not replenish. Upon reaching zero, you die. For good. But your shield will replenish while out of combat. And once reaching your final hit point, you cannot die unless your shield is completely depleted first. In other words, with careful and skillful play you can survive a very long time with a single point of health. This overall idea of careful gameplay is a recurring theme in Ghost Song. Primarily, this aspect is emphasized by your proficiency meter. This yellow meter below your hit points gauges how well you're doing and rewards you for it. The more kills you rack up without sustaining damage, the more it will fill, and the fuller it is, the less damage you take and the more you dish out. Also, when it's full, you have unlimited ammo. This mechanic becomes imperative to combat, especially when using the special weapons which don't replenish unless you rest at a save point. These 12 special weapons are things like a plasma cannon that doesn't have a limited range like the normal blaster, a scatter burst for a shotgun effect, or gel bombs which do damage and open up completely optional sections of the map. And exactly like many of the areas these items unlock, all of these special items are completely optional as well. You don't need them to make it through the main section of the game. Now to me, completely optional bosses or whole areas is always a mark of a good game. It reminds me of those obscure means to find the painted world in Dark Souls or the orphanage in Bloodborne. Secrets like these are what get people talking, bait interests, and keep people coming back. As we go down the list of Souls-like games, you start to realize that the most striking differences between them stem from their player perspectives. We've got 2D side view, isometric, top-down. These perspectives help to add their own twist and flavor to each game. So we've already talked about the isometric Ata. Now let's talk about Salt and Sanctuary. This is a game that embraces its side-on, flat 2D perspective and as a result, it's one of the few titles that can truly incorporate proper platforming. There are many times where your ability to calculate jumps intertwines with the gameplay. Take for example this scene in the forest, where not only do you have to stop yourself missing a platform, but you're fighting off a horde of acrobatic archers while doing so. It becomes this tricky, elaborate dance that simply couldn't be replicated in any other of these games. Not even Dark Souls, which is a truly 3D game. How you move around and through the environment isn't the only important aspect of controlling your character throughout Salt and Sanctuary. Movement during combat is equally vital to your survival. The first thing you need to learn is that, often, enemy models can't just be moved through unless you dodge through them or through one of their attacks. So you might think of this sort of like the 2D version of invincibility frames from Dark Souls. As a result of this, perfectly maintaining distance and knowing how far an enemy can extend is really important in this game. And overall, combat is something that Sultan Sanctuary gets right. Enemies have a fair wind-up before their attacks, and the animations for these attacks are well polished, allowing you to see when something is coming your way. And in all of these Souls-like games, this is so important. Combat revolves around dodging enemy attacks and being able to block and parry them, and the only way a player can do that is if they're well animated. As you watch these gameplay scenes, pay special attention to that and appreciate how well it's done. So luckily then, with combat being so important, just like in any Souls game, there are many ways to approach character creation, and in turn, the way you approach battle situations is altered depending on player preference and the way you build your character. If you want to fight from afar and cast spells, then you can do that. And if you want to be an agile, katana-wielding ninja, then you can do that too. It's an RPG that lets you play as a different type of character and every mode of combat you choose is viable. You can't even say the same for Dark Souls, where playing as an archer or a spellcaster often doesn't feel very viable at all. So all of these character customization aspects are determined through the game's robust skill tree. This is where you choose how to customize your character, from the armor you can wear, to the weapons you can wield, to the magic or miracles you can cast, and the stat points you prefer. All of these points are allocated by leveling up with the salt that you've collected. And salt, it operates exactly like the soul experience points from Dark Souls. 
In addition, bosses leave behind special salts or pieces that can then be used to transmute into special weapons or gear. These transmutations take place at your sanctuary, and as the name of the game would imply, sanctuaries are very important. The safety of sanctuaries are like if Dark Souls' bonfires and covenant system were somehow wrapped into one. Different gods bring about different benefits at a sanctuary, and depending on the idols worshipped there, you can summon various merchants and helpers. These idols and the NPCs they summon range from things like a blacksmith to reinforce your armor and weapons, the alchemist who can transmute boss items into powerful, unique weapons, a guide who will provide a fast travel system between other sanctuaries, or even a cell sword which will allow you to enter local co-op to go adventuring with a friend. Yes, I dare say that between the platforming and the sanctuaries, there's some ideas in Sultan Sanctuary that are actually executed and implemented better than similar aspects in the Souls games. Now we've saved the best one for last. Obviously there's no other game that quite captures the essence of Dark Souls quite like Slashy Souls. This is an amazing runner that's just so fantastic, <laughs> I'm just kidding. That game is terrible. The actual last game I want to talk about is Necropolis. The first thing about Necropolis that will grab your attention is the unique and eye-catching artistic style. It's minimalistic and abstract while finding its niche. Without question, Necropolis trades dreary settings and decrepit dragons for something different. You might find a scroll that says, magic word, magic word, magic word, picture of a horse, magic word. It makes me think that your adventurer picked up a scroll, couldn't recognize any of the inscriptions, saw a picture of a horse, and said, yep, that sure is a magic scroll. Now from goofy item descriptions that read like this to bright and geometric driven aesthetics, it's clearly obvious that Necropolis doesn't take itself quite as seriously as a Souls game. And with that, at first glance, it's easy to get lost in the sleek, attractive visuals or tongue-in-cheek humor on the surface. But don't let that fool you. At its core, Necropolis is a punishing roguelike. As a matter of fact, the roguelike element is brilliantly built into nearly every aspect of Necropolis. It goes beyond just traditional permadeath and changing the map every time you die. The roguelike elements go so far as to change the effects of potions from game to game. Meaning a blue potion in one playthrough might give you iron skin or turn you invisible, while in the next it could cause vomiting or petrification instead. This adds a certain level of doubt and mistrust built right into the game. Not only are you distrustful of navigating an ever-changing environment confidently, but you can't even rely on items to save you either. But with all that said, if Necropolis is a roguelike at its core, then at its fiery center it's actually a Souls-like, right down to the controller scheme. Necropolis handles extremely similar to Dark Souls. Literally almost every button is mapped the exact same as Dark Souls, and its combat handles just as tight and precise as any Souls game too. The difference here being the way stamina operates. It actually takes on some Monster Hunter characteristics if you're familiar with that. Meaning after fighting, jumping, blocking, and all that good stuff, your character will gain fatigue, continually decreasing your stamina pool until the point where you can only swing your weapon once without needing to wait to regain your stam. You'll need to craft then, or pick up slabs of food to eat. Consuming these pieces of food will regenerate your stamina fatigue. You also have special attacks which can be activated by holding down either your standard attack or your power attack until your weapon charges. These usually send you into a flurry of deadly movements, but they eat a ton of your stamina and cause fatigue very quickly, so spamming these moves is not a very viable option. And upon killing enemies you'll receive a lot of gems. Like souls, these gems can be exchanged for different gear, potions, consumables, or even pay for a blessing at a special goddess statue. These blessings in essence are like leveling up. They permanently increase your strength, health, and damage resistance. Obviously, this will make you more proficient in combat as you try to descend deeper and deeper into the amalgamated and ever-changing necropolis below. Now, the final product will have a different UI, as that's going through a rework. And I haven't tried it yet, but Necropolis will have a fully integrated online co-op system when it officially releases as well. Also, Necropolis has the best vendor ever. What's not to love? Alright guys, thanks for watching. In the end, my hope is that we've brought to light some games that might interest you. I put this video together with the help of Vadi because we both want to bring attention to these games that deserve it. So if you could hit the like button, leave a comment, whatever, it'd be appreciated. I'd also like to thank Vadi for his contribution to the video. You can go check out his channel where he does a Souls-like series in which he dives much deeper into both Eta as well as Salt and Sanctuary in addition to other games. 
You can check those out by clicking here. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the developers for supplying these builds of their games. Most of the games featured are being developed by really small teams, most only a handful of people, and I know they worked really hard to get me special builds by the deadline for this video, so I'd like to thank you for that. Alright guys, thanks for watching, go check out some of these games, and I'll see you in the next one.